Welcome to this RF Industry Icon podcast. I'm Pat Hindle, and it's been a little while since we've done an RF Icon podcast, so I'm happy to be talking today with Dr. Mao Chung Frank Chang, who is the WinTech Chair in Electrical Engineering and Distinguished Professor at University of California, Los Angeles. Prior to joining UCLA, Dr. Chang was the Assistant Director and Department Manager of the High Speed Electronics Laboratory of Rockwell International Science Center in Thousand Oaks, California. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the U.S. National Academy of Inventors, and an academic at the Academia Sinica of Taiwan. Professor Chang was recently honored with the 2023 IEEE RSE James Clerk Maxwell Medal at the prestigious IEEE VIX Summit and Honor Ceremony in Atlanta in May. As a part of this distinguished IEEE medal, Frank has been recognized for his contributions to heterojunction device technology and CMOS system on chip realizations with unprecedented reconfigurability and bandwidth. He was additionally honored with the IEEE David Starnoff Award in 2006 for developing and commercializing gas HBT and BiFET power amplifiers, which have dominated the smartphone transmitters worldwide production for the past two and a half decades. Welcome, Dr. Chang. Thank you. Thank you for interviewing me. Yeah. So uh, you received your degrees from several universities in Taiwan. Can you tell us about your educational experience and kind of what led up to your path in electronics? Sure. Yeah. I started uh, with my undergraduate uh, BS in, in physics, actually. That was in the uh, National Taiwan University, the uh, oldest and the most comprehensive university on Taiwan Island. Uh, where I learned the most, uh, the uh, including the modern physics, and also I enjoyed very much uh, in uh, building the equipment or instrument uh, for physical the uh, measurements. For example, I was assigned to build the uh, entire system, including the uh, scintillation counters uh, with a Geiger head the front end to detect the radiation from the X-ray. And the X-ray, by the way, is also made by student. Homemade. So uh, very often I have to struggle with the uh, vacuum of the system. For example, we need a 10 to minus six tour in order to operate. And often I got into 10 to minus three, minus four, and I have to work overnight, over days to just uh, to get the sealed off the uh, the leaks in order to get the X-ray to work. And I was given the four different samples of five actually the transitional elements. I was told. You know, among all those transitional elements and to try to identify which five elements actually are those just based on the X-ray, the copper alpha line that I can detect and then measure the absorption the coefficient. I was uh, very successfully managed that. In the end, I find a very interesting curve, you know, it kind of curving up to the number four elements, then it have a cliff down. And uh, that is uh, that only happens once in the, within the transition the elements, for example, then I find that was a cobalt, uh, the elements uh, in there. So that kind of uh, the experiment, uh, you have to build your own scientific equipment, that taught me a lot. And uh, later, um, without thinking of uh, going uh, abroad, at that time, that was uh, a, a very real, because most of my students will, will the, uh, end up in the US right away without wasting their time, but I wasted enough time to go into the next, next national, the uh, Tsinghua University and getting my material science degree. And uh, uh, from there, I learned the uh, solid state thermodynamics. Uh, I knew the um, start to find out uh, how powerful the thermodynamics could be, not just on the textbook, uh, uh, read uh, like the philosophy, but actually has some usefulness yeah, in material science. Yeah. Uh, so that training also gave me a chance to learn the power methodology in building the fur eyes and the others, uh, the ceramics. So that, that's where I learned. But into the end, I realized the semiconductor is on the horizon uh, to, uh, to rise. Yeah. So I moved to the third university right next to the National Tsinghua and eventually next to the Xinzhu Science Park. There was the National Jiao Tong University. Jiao Tong means communication in Chinese. So there I... I was uh, one of the earliest students in Taiwan who are uh, actually getting into the uh, semiconductor of the device physics and the device technology. Uh, I was able to design 
and uh, fabricate the uh, high frequency impact impact ionization and uh, transit time device for microwave applications. Then that's uh, where I learned the microwave device and that impact not only impact the device but impact my my career for the lifetime. Thank you. Those are my different universities, uh, different majors that 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 made my education very rewarding and interesting. Wow, you had a great background in all types of materials uh, leading to electronics. And so I think then you came to the U.S. and you were a principal investigator at Rockwell in leading DARPA's ultra-high-speed ADC and DAC development for direct yeah. conversion transceivers and digital uh, radar systems. Can you, can you tell us about those programs and their focus? Sure. Uh, actually, that was inspired by the, prof the Professor Herb Cromer. If you uh, understand, the uh, Cromer was the Nobel Physics uh, laureate uh, in the year 2000. Yeah, he actually had uh, this idea to use a uh, different material uh, to form the junctions. One is we call the wider band gap uh, material, uh, and the other side is a, is a narrow band. So it happened to be uh, uh, in 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 our case is aluminum gallium arsenide as a wide band material, and the gallium arsenide as a, a little bit narrow band. Yeah, so it was 1979 um, after Cromer invented or, uh, uh, you know, he actually patented his idea after 40 some years, he declared on the proceeding of the IEEE stated that uh, this is a time to grow such a hydrogen junction device uh, because the molecular being epitaxy, uh, the, the particular material goals, the methodology will make that to happen. So he encouraged DAPA to invest on in this area. So Rockwell Science Center, we are very close to UC Santa Barbara. So we invited him as our technical consultant and we started to getting into the header junction business. Yeah. So after that, uh, mom, probably since 1979 until almost, I, I should say uh, uh, early 1990, DAPA has invested more than 150 million US dollars into this technology for gallium arsenide. And we started uh, uh, from the material growth, for example, using Tchaikovsky methodology to grow the pool, the four inch wafers. Actually, we do that and we, we know how to, how to grow the material, how to cut it. And we know how to uh, build the heterojunction device to grow by MBE, by layers uh, on top of that uh, for some uh, high speed uh, integrated circuit. So all the way from the boom materials, all the way to the integrated circuits, all done by uh, the research group I belong to. Yeah, and the, the, the research group was started by uh, Dr. Peter Asbeck. I don't know if you know him. He's a very famous in our field and he ended up in the San Diego UCSD as a, as a professor, now retired recently. So he was the first one. And then one night, the two of us was together in uh, in processing or washing our wafers so we get to know each other. And I was invited by him to join him uh, to work on this. And I started uh, uh, my career into Hitler Junction because of that. And then later it was uh, subsequently uh, demonstrate the, uh, the integrated circuits that we build the integrated circuits, uh, not only HBT, but the BIFED. BIFED is the planar, planar HBT plus the planar FET, fuel effect transistor. I made the two of them on one wafer with the same device uh, layer structure. That's the next question I think you're gonna ask me. What is the layout? What is the vertical topology of the structure? We made the device not only good for high performance, uh, high frequency, the operation, but the high breakdown voltage. So initially, we were asked uh, the because the DAPA, uh, their, their highest uh, interest is to build the EW electronic weapon, you know, for the, the uh, ages, for example, the phase array, the uh, antennas, for example, they need the A to Ds, the D to As uh, for digital receivers. Uh, that was in your question. Yeah. So that was uh, the purpose. So we were the first one to actually accomplish so-called sampling speed over one gigahertz. We demonstrated the first uh, one giga sample per second, 12-bit uh, D to A digital to analog converter and uh, accomplished, you know, one to, to two gigahertz sampling. Okay, but the eight to 10 bits uh, A to D, 
analog to digital converter. Those uh, devices are actually they prevail until today. They're still you know, the, you know, heavily uh, utilized by many, many of the systems, you know, that equipped uh, into, into the various uh, battleships and, and others uh, yeah, very widely, yeah, very widely known for that. So I like the old style, you know, government, they have a mind to build a revolutionary technology, you know, and consistently for many years, more than one decade. Yeah, the huge the, the investment, but also the huge return. In the end, um, other than the A2D D2S we built for DAPA, we were also invited by that time by a new company called Qualcomm in San Diego. They're building the first generation of CDMA phones at that time. In order to make the few tests very successful in Hutchinson, Hong Kong, and in South Korea, they need the uh, super efficient, you know, and a highly linear the, the power amplifier. Yeah. So Professor the uh, at that time at UCSD, Professor also the co-founder of the uh, uh, Qualcomm came to us. I was a Jack uh, Irvine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he uh, he come to the us and they said, can you guys build the six power amplifier within two months? So we actually handmade a six power amplifier for them. And they used that for Hutchinson. And uh, in the first uh, test, it was uh, successful. So that started the new era for the uh, CDMA phone. So, so that was uh, in the history. And after that, because the CDMA started to grow up and our HBT also got grown into the cell phone. So right now, if uh, you are using any of the smartphones, so you open that. All the transmitter is based on the technology we developed. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's so impressive that you you know grew your own bulls and made your own wafers and then did the ICs. Um, right. So was that when you you moved to UCLA to develop the HBT yeah. and BiFET, and that's when you worked with Qualcomm? That's right. Uh, well, we I I done the job. So we uh, also I was uh, asked to transfer the technology to production in order to meet the. Uh, Jacob the uh, Irvine's uh, needs. So we provide that and uh, they're very successful. Then the company decided to build a production line in Newberry Park just to build there. In the past two and a half decades, more than 100 billion power amplifier has been built by the technology. And the US was able to dominate on this technology. And, well, and the production the production was done at Connexin, which is now part of Sky. Oh, in the Newberry Park, the main site, but they did flow over a little bit to Taiwan. I mean, one of the, the at that time, the guy who worked with me to transfer the technology, he quit the company. He said he need to he wanted to go back to Taiwan. Then at that time, the company said, "Okay, you can go back, but you work for us. <laughs> you work for your company, and we overflow our volume to you." Yeah. And what were the challenges in transferring it to production? Oh, the biggest thing is the reliability. We were able to identify the main the, uh, degradation the, uh, mechanism is the recombination, the you know, electron hole recombination in the emitter base junction. So we need to utilize a special technique to passively the emitter base junction, we call the thin latch, using the particular uh, the technique we can avoid the carrier flowing into the emitter based junction, which is aluminum gamma's line and the gallium oxide interface. So that cures uh, the problem. So we made our customer, the uh, yeah, Urban Jacob, the extremely happy and uh, they 100% adopted that. And the phone, then uh, all cell phones adopted. Yeah, because they don't have any other choice. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's the most efficient amplifier that you can use for that application. Mm -hmm. So as part of your distinguished IEEE medal, you are recognized for your contributions to heterojunction device technology and CMOS system on chip realizations with unprecedented reconfigurability and bandwidth. And you are the inventor of the multiband reconfigurable RF interconnects for chip multiprocessor, intercore communications and interchip CPU to memory communications. That's a mouthful. So can you tell us about that technology and its application? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, when I look at the uh, interconnect, you know, from die to die or from chip to chip, 
uh, because of my RF background, you know, high frequency background. I look at that and uh, I say, this is a little bit strange. We only push the, uh, uh, the interconnect to carry digital signals with a very broadband from DC all the way to uh, three gigahertz, right? We cannot increase it because uh, the heat problem, the dissipation problem. But we also wanted uh, to push it uh, for uh, different uh, interpins and uh, many others. Uh, but pin and the pins between the logic and memory, they're not compatible because the logic of the, the circuits are very dense. Memory is less. Uh, most of the time, the memory also, uh, only have a very limited number of uh, pins. And your logic, you have too many pins. How do you talk to, to each other? Okay. Then Samsung say, oh, we have a called a YIO. I increase the number of the pins, increase the so so many of them to the extent they started to affect the size and the cost. Then I say, we can easily solve the problem by sharing limited number of uh, pins or unscalable number of pins by using the different frequencies. Each of the pin physically, I can use a, a multiple carrier, modulate the digital signal, right? For example, I can use a DC as a band, I can use a three gigahertz as a band, I can use a six gigahertz as a band, I can use a nine gigahertz as a band, and I can use a 12 gigahertz. So I can, in principle, I can reduce the number of pins by number of carriers. I use four channels, I suddenly I reduce the number of pins by a factor of four, right? So that with that in mind, I start to build this, what we call a multi-band interconnect, and then later was a, was funded by SRC, by NSF, and by DAPA. So right now, especially uh, for the uh, TSV, you know, through the silicon the vias, I think that because those are six micron the the pillars, right? You know, yeah, uh, it, it's uh, not scalable, not scalable because of the thermal requirement. I think that they will find that this kind of multi band is more and more uh, important. On the other hand. If you have a multi-core, if you increase the number of cores in the CPUs or GPUs to, to increase, then sometime uh, you'd like to have a network on the chip so you can do a, the broadcast, you know, to inform the, all the chips at the same time. You use the basement, come on, it's not possible. You're gonna intrude with each other. Why not? You know, with uh, with the loop and the using carrier, you just send it uh, just like a, we listen to the radios through the broadcasting. So that's another reason to use the, the microwave modulated the uh, interconnect. For those, I I it's just uh, you know patent all kind of possibilities and uh, as a spun of a company and that company um, was eventually sold to uh, Molex to the big interconnect company and. Uh, uh, then um, I think that for many industrial applications, uh, like uh, for the phones, you know, the full, full phone, you know, when you open the phone, you double the size, but actually, uh, you know, you, you although you don't see it, there is a wireless interconnect in the back there to send the information back and forth. And uh, for the big buildings, the panel on the building, uh, or the world movies, those that, that then you can use uh, it's in such a technology, so you can do it at the, you know, every the square, uh, you know, it's it just a piece by piece, you can build them. You don't need to do an entire piece, but they they connect it with a wireless interconnect, which you cannot see, the multi-band, high-frequency modulated uh, the panel, big panel. Very interesting. And uh, you were the first to demonstrate CMOS active passive imagers at millimeter wave frequencies. Can you tell us about that work? Yeah, in terms of the, the imager, uh, we started uh, uh, interested in that because of there is a security needs. We need to detect uh, something is, uh, is conceived, you know, it, it, it's, you cannot see it. For example, underneath your clothing or other things uh, uh, that like you, you, you try to detect. And the millimeter wave is uh, the perfect frequency uh, to probe that kind of things. So started that uh, we we did the uh, active, we using the classical the uh, Armstrong invented we call the regenerative receivers uh, that, that was a perfect uh, uh, with the high detectivity 
uh, to detect the frequency that we send it out because we know what's the exact frequency then we can aim for that. So we kind of uh, uh, decoded that with some kind of, because we need the, the quenching circuit. Once it's reached to a certain oscillation point, then we uh, can detect the time. So we call the time encoded there. Yeah. That was a very successful. We did uh, a, a few of them. The, Probably the first one is uh, 183 gigahertz. Then later we did uh, 495 gigahertz. At that time, that was the high, highest frequency you can do. Then we noticed that there is a, one problem. If you have a metal parts, uh, something like a guns and others, um, you know, even you can see the, uh, under the uh, closes, but if the gun tilted uh, with high angle, then that caused the signal, the reflection signal, uh, the signal reflected to a different direction. You can get the 100 dB loss uh, uh, right there, you know, and it makes things hard to be uh, detectable. So because of that, then we start to be interested in actually doing passive kind of imaging. What is a passive imaging? I don't shine any beam on you, but because your body heat, you know, due to the black body radiation, then we can detect around 100 gigahertz. I can detect your body heat because it was blocked by the metal. So no matter which direction you go, because that's a unanimous, yeah, everywhere, only directional, right? So, so the, that's uh, made us uh, interested in doing the passive image. We were also the first one to demonstrate the passive image of that. So all do the things I would eventually we do try colors. You know, we do three frequencies uh, with the intermodulated regenerator receivers that never done before. So that was a lot of fun there. Even readers eventually we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you see those uh, millimeter wave imagers are kind of taking over the security scanning from mm -hmm. X rays. Mm -hmm. So now so. in the airport, yeah. So yeah. yeah, so frequently used. So you uh, also pioneered the development of self healing fifty seven to sixty four gigahertz radio on trip. I think it was DARPA's Helix program mm -hmm. with embedded sensors, actuators, and self diagnosis curing capabilities for enhanced performance yield. And this is to counter the process variations and aging effects. You know, what applications does this have? And, you know, what is this technology about? Well, for example, if we have this millimeter wave radios in the satellite, if we started to age or because of some uh, PVD, you know, the variation effects for the temperatures and thresholds and other, you know, uh, occasions, it starts to degrade performance. If we need the person on the ground to send a command uh, to the radio to fix it, that would take time. And it take time to do a diagnosis as well. Why not to build a smart radio? They can do a diagnosis themselves. Then they find they're sick, right? And they have their own the ways to heal themselves. Would that be nice? So that was the idea by the, uh, by the DAPA. At that time, they are interested in doing such things uh, in the remote uh, systems uh, that they can detect their own problem and fix their own problem. Yeah, when we started, we saw that this is a kind of crazy idea. <laughs> yeah, but uh, then we carefully think. We say, oh, because it got the, the radio, it has its own transmitter, it got its own receiver. So actually, you can pump the signal for your own transmitter. Um, you can. You can actually fit that with some attenuations into your receiver and detect, you know, uh, the, some of the imbalance between the uh, IQ or some of the harmonics or some other things. That then actually, you can change the, you can tune the bias of the the transmitter and uh, have them fix it. That is totally possible. So, so we started to do that and start with some of the the detectors, the sensors, the power, and we call the envelope the detector too to detect what's coming out of the, the power amplifier, the signal. Yeah, uh, are they strong enough? Are they too weak? Uh, are they linear enough? Uh, or do they have any, any any of the imbalance problems? Yeah, and the feed into its own receiver. Um, then we can adjust the, the imbalance, the magnitude, the offset, all that to make it balance and work. So with that, we actually demonstrated this uh, 50, uh, 57 to 60, 64 gigahertz. Actually, the entire radio 
make the performance yield under different the temperature DAPA have the specific conditions for testing. And we demonstrate that to the Navy people outside in UCRA, and then the DAPA, uh, the manager sitting on there to watch, you know, to watch the performance of the radio. On purposely, we make the radio performance very bad initially and push the bottom and see the radio itself actually heal the problem by just by itself. Yeah, without the oh. intervention. Yeah. That's very impressive. I, it's very interesting. So did you have to kind of predict what would go wrong so that you could add, you know, tuning and impedance changes and things like that to the circuit so it had that, you know, adjustability? No, 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 yeah, because we have a so-called self-heating controller uh, in the basement. Once we detect, uh, then we go through the uh, parameter estimator to estimate uh, to see what, what can be wrong. Then we kind of feed into the bias control, uh, we call the cautious control in, in, in the control theory. And then we do that uh, step by step, but we, we, we can get it fixed. Yeah. So That's in front cool. of the customer's eyes, <laughs> and, and under the morning, uh, the uh, Navy monitors, you know, they came from San Diego to actually look at them from <laughs> the back. <laughs> from our back and see, you did not, you did not do anything yourself, but the, the device, the, the radio actually are doing for, for itself. Yeah. yeah, you have to see it to believe it. To see it to believe. And uh, they do believe it in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you also worked on ultra-low phase noise VCOs with your uh, invented digitally controlled artificial dielectric embedded in CMOS technologies. And you varied its transmission line permittivity in real time up to 20x for realizing reconfigurable multiband mode radios in the sub-millimeter wave frequency <laughs> bands. Uh, can you explain exactly how that works? Sure. The artificial dielectric was invented in the Bell Lab, yeah, probably 45, 50 years ago. At that time, they used the uh, such a we call the slow wave and the periodical the obstacle, uh, the elements, the metal elements, in order to build the lens for microwave communication for antenna applications. But because it's hard to implement the, in the precise the locations of that to make it, uh, you know, periodical. So actually later it, it failed to uh, to commercialize. So when I uh, read in the textbook about that, that was in the classical dynamics, uh, you know, the old textbook is an entire chapter to describe that. And I find there is no application of that. <laughs> but when I started to work on the CMOS, I look at that, I say to myself, oh my goodness, because we have the precise allocation by optical lithography in IC, and I have a metal interconnect down there, I can precisely, you know, the, uh, the align and uh, duplicate and allocate all the, the metal pieces. I can, I can basically, I can synthesize the ceramics uh, on the, <laughs> with, with the metal interconnects of CMOS. That, that's what it, it, it is equivalent to, yeah. So, so I say, let's do it, yeah. So what we did is uh, do a uh, the transmission, uh, the uh, differential transmission lines on the wafer. But under the two metal transmission lines, you know, we actually put the CMOS under these, uh, put the, the metal strip, you know, uh, in, in particular to the transmission directions, but uh, there is a gap in between the these metal strips uh, along the we call the virtual ground because there's a differential transmission and there's a virtual ground right in the middle. Yeah, we split it that, but we either engage or disengage with uh, switches, similar switches there. In that, then I can change the dielectric constant because uh, I, I I just simply build the ceramics. I you know, and I can change the dielectric constant because. The each of these uh, switches, I can either leave them all on or all off, or you know the uh, in this uh, the uh, thermometer code, um, you know I can gradually change one on or on, off. In that, I I change the speed of the light. You know, and I modify the dielectric constant. With that, then I think uh, number one, when I make it all on, I can reduce the size if I need this along the uh, transmission line right now, because uh, the higher dielectric constant, I can make it uh, eight times shorter in one case. Yeah, then I can turn it on and off to modulate the dielectric constant. 
wow, this is how powerful. Yeah, never before had such a device. <laughs> People can do that. So I used that to replace the varactor on the resonator. And they got an extremely good face noise out of the oscillator. And later I used that to do what I call the direct frequency modulator. I don't need the DDAs or that at the millimeter wave. At the 300 gigahertz, I can directly modulate that and make it the the efficient in communication by building high level the modulation index like a constellation like a 1024 quant that kind of a modulation uh, it's we demonstrate all the possibility uh, and it could be reconfigurable so not only the bandwidth but also the reconfigurability both are the unprecedented wow the past, yeah yeah. And uh, another area, which I think you kind of covered a little bit, uh, you realize the first CMOS frequency synthesizer for terahertz operation with a PLL at 560 gigahertz mm -hmm. and devised the first tricolor CMOS active imager at 180 to 500 gigahertz based on time-encoded right. digital regenerative receiver and the first three-dimensional SAR imaging radar with a sub-millimeter range resolution at 144 gigahertz. That's a very high frequency stuff. Can you tell us about that work? Well, all that you need a PLL. You need a phase lock the loop. So first we build the phase lock loop at about 560 gigahertz. One reason for that is to support NASA's experiment because they want to find the water on the Mars. They need a frequency synthesizer at around 530 gigahertz to detect the water. So they need a frequency synthesizer in that range. So that's why we, we think that because of the, there is a real need, so we build it first and we can divide the frequency to make it working at the low frequencies after that for various applications, yeah, including the imaging and the others. Yeah. So in order to, to do that, then DICAT is the most powerful element of that. We have a wide uh, tunable range, uh, like uh, 40 gigahertz uh, tuning uh, range because we have a, we call the DICAT, yeah. Digital controlled artificial dielectric. Without that, it's not just not possible. And so you started uh, several companies in the US and Taiwan. Uh, you can tell yeah. us about those and how they evolved. Well, the two companies are more uh, significant. Now, one is uh, actually, uh, we eventually, because the overflow of the Rockwell line, uh, later called the Skyworks line. They need the help uh, from the outside the country when the production volume is uh, is overflowing, too, too much need, <laughs> just like uh, <laughs> in the last 20 years. They don't want to expand their US manufacturing lines uh, overly. Yeah, they just want to make it just right to, to keep the key technology. But when the volume increased too much, they wanted that to be produced uh, somewhere like that in Taiwan as their, their side the production. Yeah. So one of the uh, the managers created Rockwell and they returned to Taiwan. They started to build the, a, a foundry over there to support the activity. And uh, such a foundry, one of them uh, called uh, the Wing Semiconductor. Oh, and yeah. the semiconductor the, was IPO'd. Yeah, and the very successfully enjoy the very high the uh, production rate right now. Yeah, probably if they. I think they have a uh, probably uh, more than eighty thousand wafers uh, per year. Uh, probably even higher than that right now. Yeah, but it's it's worth the biggest uh, foundry, but uh, it started to support the uh, uh, Skyworks. That it end up is also making production for Broadcom. Yeah. Yeah, so the two biggest, uh, the HBT the vendor, one is uh, Skyward Solutions out of the my original Rockwell team, and also the uh, Broadcom, and also out of my original Rockwell team, there's an engineer, uh, the yeah, Dr. Park. Yeah, he was a designer, a PA designer. He went back initially to National Seoul University as a faculty, then eventually got invited back by uh, by the Broadcom uh, to uh, to be the head of that their their division uh, their division head yeah to work on so these two companies are, are probably eighty percent of the worldwide market right now yeah 
And so RFMD also adopted that, which is now Corvo. Oh, yeah. is, did they use the same configuration? That's right. They use the same foundry. That's right. So basically, I, I build the foundry for all. <laughs> yeah. And the, the other company I feel proud of is a, a company called Neuron, K-N-E-R-O-N. Um, if you just read the news yesterday, they just raised a 40, 47 million US dollars to build the edge AI uh, transformer. Yeah, for various applications in AI, especially for ADAS applications. That was uh, three of my students and plus uh, another student from uh, Professor Rick Wessel's group at UCRA. So these are uh, UCRA students, they bundled together went to San Diego. So, so far they raised 170 million US dollars. Yeah, and right now grew up to maybe 250 engineers. Yeah. So they're going pretty strong. I'm pretty happy for them. Yeah, for these uh, young excellent. guys. Yeah, they're, they're really excellent. Yeah, they're now in the challenging the NVIDIA in this area. Yes, yeah. that's great. <laughs> yeah. And so finally, I wanted to end up, you know, with the last question about, you know, what are some of the most exciting areas of research in the wireless technology that you think will infect, you know, the future systems? Yeah, I think the... Uh, the scaling most important in engineering, uh, in advancing the 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 state of the arts, yeah. In the semiconductor, of course, is the feature size of scaling, which is about ten to the eighth so from you know ten to minus three to ten to minus nine today. You know, um, and it's uh, it's about in that range. But uh, for the information scaling, we're about the same. We're from the hundred kilohertz. Initially, by the first radio, you know, when now we end up with the 300 gigahertz. So we are about the 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 also. So it's more slow for the information scaling, I, I, I should call. But we should not stop at the uh, uh, some millimeter wave or terahertz. We should continue to advance all the way to optics, for example, to 400, 800 uh, terahertz. We have a long way to go. <laughs> the engineers, the micro engineers, your career is almost infinite yes. <laughs> in years. Okay, for you to pursue that, so don't feel too frustrated and in the, in the confined right now. But we do need a good uh, super device right now. I would say there's a transit time limited. Transit time limited be, because if you have a drain and a source, right? And your carrier, which is uh, most time the electron, sometimes is the host, they transit from the uh, the uh, source and the drain will take so much time. Even you are down to a fine nanometer, uh, the cutoff frequency, we call that F sub T or F max, or maximum oscillation frequency, is about 400 gigahertz. That's it. Yeah. Now go beyond that, uh, go beyond that, then you have to learn something from me using some the nonlinear effect, you know, to, to push for the, uh, uh, you can triple push the using COVID or other means to do that. But basically we are run out of steam after that, you know, at the terahertz, I would say, you know. Uh, so, but on the other hand, band gap limited device is an optical device. We do need a transition from the uh, transit time limit to band gap limited device. Okay, how do we do that? Well, my proposal, I gave a talk on that is uh, I suggest to replace the CMOS drain by the uh, gallium nitride, by nitride. Nitride is a compound and you can build a photonic device on top of that drain. And it happened to be gallium nitride. If you group in the 111 orientation of the silicon substrate, is a lattice matched with a rumen gallium oxide. And uh, after the, uh, the growth for many, many layers and merge it together, they will have a non polar gallium nitride on top of that. And you can build a photonic device right there on the CBO string if you can replace the silicon uh, by the gallium nitride. And this device will give you band gap limited, you know, the optical emitters and the receivers. And with that, you can build a multi-color only with a nitride base, but the, you change the, the content of the Indian. That will bring you to cover all the way from infrared to, to the ultraviolet, you know. That will, be, that will be the future life for our micro engineers. And good luck to all. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And wonderful future. Yeah. 
Yeah. I look forward to that device being realized soon. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We all hope. Yeah, I think that I would, I would, I would devote uh, most of my time in, in pursuing that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today, Dr. Chang. Yeah. It's been a delight. Um, you have a lifelong journey. You've covered so many technologies. I'm just blown away by the number of different thank technologies you. you've worked with. And you're truly an RF icon. And to our listeners, you can find more podcasts at podcast.microwavejournal.com. Thanks for listening. Thank